This is Father Patrick Riska. This is Father Bonaventure Chapman. Welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy our show, please consider making a monthly donation to us on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. Friends, we have an amazing guest. We always have amazing guests on God's Planning, but we have we have we have an amazing guest for you today. I'm so excited to welcome to God's Planning Dr. Kenneth Craycraft. Ken, welcome to God's Planning. Thank you, Father Patrick, uh, Father Bonaventure, Bonaventure. It's uh, good to be with you today. We are really interested in the work that you've prepared because I think there's nothing else like it. So friends, um, we invited uh, Dr. Craycraft on to talk about his recent book. It's just come out from our Sunday Visitor, a publication you may have heard of and a publishing house <laughs> you may know because I talk <laughs> about it constantly because it's what I'm doing right now. Anyway, um, so... <laughs> Dr. Craigraft's new book, Citizens Yet Strangers, is a fantastic and accessible text giving American Catholics a new political vision. So, so I really mean it when I say there's, there is nothing else like it today. Ken has done something, I think, incredibly unique, and he's given us a framework that we need, especially because this year is an election year. Uh, that's why I think this book is so important, and that's why I thought it was... Um, worth jumping on uh, and bringing over here to God's planning. Um, mostly also because I want to see Father Bonaventure just grill Ken on, on the book. So I figured that would be great too. So so thanks you both for, for, for humoring me. Uh, Ken, why don't you say a little bit about the book and what, what led you to pick up such a big topic? Well, first of all, thank you for that introduction. I, I really appreciate it. And the, 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 my favorite part of your introduction was your description of the book as accessible, even more than unique, even more than, uh, than uh, saying something uh, important is accessible, because that was the point of the book. We wanted to, we wanted to produce a book, obviously, uh, for, through a popular press, not an academic press. Uh, and admittedly, the book does uh, walk the line between uh, an, an academic scholarly book and a popular book. But we wanted uh, where we could to err on the side of or not really err, but but tend toward the side of of it being accessible because the book is not written for a scholar. Uh, certainly, certainly I want scholars to read it. And I'm uh, pleased with the scholars who have taken it up already uh, and are either in the process of reviewing. But I, but what, more importantly, we want it to be accessible to the, the, the well-read conscientious Catholic who is looking for uh, a way to try to think about not just political life, but broader issues of cultural life and social life, including social obligations, uh, that make sense from the standpoint of Catholic social doctrines, Catholic moral theology more generally, but are having trouble figuring out how that works in the American context. So the book actually has grown out of a class that I teach at Mount St. Mary Seminary in Cincinnati, where I teach uh, the, uh, uh, seminarians preparing for the priesthood, uh, called Catholic Social Doctrine. And um, as I taught, have taught the course now for several years, uh, I thought it would really be a good thing for the way that I approach these questions to try to find a broader audience. So I approached OSV and, and pitched the book and they thought it was a good idea. And essentially the, the book uh, is built upon uh, the idea that we American Catholics have largely, if not forgotten, uh, aban or abandoned our, 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 quote, native language, unquote, our, our mm -hmm. own idioms and our own vocabulary, if we haven't forgotten it, we have tended to collapse it into what it means to be an American liberal. And, 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 and therefore, we, all kinds of things, all kinds of ramifications come from that. Uh, if, we, if we don't even know how to speak Catholic, for example, to one another, then it's going to be very difficult for us to speak Catholic to the broader culture. Um, and, and, I, and I see that as a problem in American Catholicism, that, that our moral lives are more determined and defined by political life or by the political ideas that inform the American founding. And what's worse is to be, get a little bit more granular, they're informed more by party identification than they are by a robust understanding of the Catholic moral life. To put it in, is simply, we've forgotten our language or we've collapsed that language into something else. So I begin, as I, as I like to describe the book, I begin with chapter one with what I, what, with what I call the, a, a destructive chapter um, where I sort of tear down 
where I what I think is the problem. And then I spend the rest of the chapters trying to build up a positive case for thinking in terms of Catholic moral doctrine, specifically Catholic social doctrine, what I call the four pillars of, of dignity, subsidiarity, solidarity, and the common good. And of course, uh, we're recording this the, the day after uh, 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 the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith has issued a major document on the dignity of the human person, the infinite dignity of the human person. And I'm very pleased to, to see that come out uh, ba basically at the same time as my book, because these are the questions that I, that I address in the book. Yeah, luckily the document doesn't render the book useless. So that was nice. <laughs> no, no, not no. at all. Not at all. I haven't read the, the document. document. It, maybe, the, it, maybe it cites yeah. the book. I don't know. It doesn't, but the document should be read in light of the book. That's that's the way. That's <laughs> that's the way. <clears> okay, good. So, the, so the book, <laughs> folks, Ken's book is actually a hermeneutic key, hermeneutical key. There you go. Uh, to read the document, you can't understand the document without the book, in the way that you can't understand the Bible without the magisterium's teachings. Uh, so, this is a very important book, as you could tell. Um, insofar as the document is, is an important document, although it, let's assume that the book is also more important, even if this document is not an important document, but I assume it is. Um, Okay, so again, I, this is great. I like the balance that there's a dualism or a tension or, between being American and Catholic. At least yeah. on the surface, it seems that way because being Catholic, and this is true for being a, a Catholic in general, Augustine set up yes. this two cities kind of vision, the yep. city of man, city of God in, the, yep. in his uh, city of God. Um, and, and we meet this as Catholics in a particular way. I teach political philosophy across the street at CUA. Um, I'm not an expert in it, so nothing nice. So just take this with a grain of salt, but still have teachers undergrad, so I'm enough expert enough to teach, I suppose. And uh, I remember, <clears throat> let's put it this way, for this, to bring out this, this tension in the American and Catholic background, is I remember reading a long time ago an article by John Rao, who's an Oxford scholar, um, who said, uh, at the title of the, of the article, which one of those, it's one of those titles that gives away the whole article itself, was um, Founding Fathers versus Church Fathers, 666 to 0. And uh, <laughs> so let's say it was a nuanced and balanced uh, conception of, but what he, he, at least that title always stuck with me as, as raising the kind of one initial fundamental concern or objection is that the founding fathers are political liberals, not in the sense of the progressive, but in the sense of individualistic kind of sense. And Catholics are, as you mentioned, one of the pillars is the common good. And the common good trumps the individual. Whereas if you read the Declaration, if you read um, John Locke's Second Treatise, if you read our, read our founding fathers' accounts of, of, of uh, political discourse, it's based on the individual's coming together in a contract. So maybe just lay us out the, how is it that American and Catholics kind of come together, uh, at least with this common good individual case? Well, that you, you tee it up perfectly well. And, and in fact, uh, it, it, what I describe in the book is I use Thomas Hobbes as my foil because regardless of, of what kind of overt influence John Locke had on the founding generation, and it's clear that he did, uh, Thomas Jeff, you mentioned Locke's second letter. Thomas Jefferson had a heavily annotated copy, which is still extant. We have it of uh, the second letter and also the letter concerning toleration. Uh, uh, Jefferson called Locke, along with Bacon and Newton, one of the three greatest men that ever lived. Uh, there's a glaring mm -hmm. omission uh, in that list, of course, uh, of the three, <laughs> three greatest men that ever lived are Locke, Newton, and Bacon. But Locke himself referred to Hobbes and uh, to Hobbes' Contra. strange new strange new doctrine of individualism. And he didn't repudiate it. In fact, he adopted it. But he tried basically what I the way that I like to explain it is Locke tried to smooth out the rough ed edges of Hobbes. Mm -hmm. But what we have now is, as you say, an individualist, uh, an individualist anthropology informing a polity, a political, mm -hmm. uh, a political ideology. And that's what the United States is. And, and I, I appreciate and I actually want to mm -hmm. e expand the point that you mm -hmm. say that when we talk about liberal, we're talking about classical liberalism, not not the word that describes the left wing of the American political spectrum, typically identified with the Democrat. But as I say in the first chapter, we're all liberals. I mean, that's what we are as Americans. The question is, as we Catholics uh, face that, how uh, how liberalism or how much liberalism or Catholicism defines how we think about politics. Now, I would not say 666 versus <laughs> zero on the one hand, but on the other hand, I would say that if we, if we are not very attentive to 
the moral anthropology of liberalism and the story that it tells us about the human person, then we are very likely to succumb to those definitions. And those definitions are at best in tension with and at worst in contradiction to uh, Catholic notions of solidarity and the common good. And mm -hmm. so the question then becomes, the first question then for us Catholics is how, what, what informs our understanding of public life, of the individual person, of community, and, and, and all of those things that are so important in the way that we articulate our presence in public life, and then ask ourselves after that, how and to what extent are those compatible with, in tension with, contradictory, contradicted by the political philosophy, the moral philosophy that informs the politics of the American regime? And now, and, and I, I want to emphasize that the book itself is not is much broader than politics. There's one chapter on politics. It's the last chapter, mm -hmm. and it's the shortest chapter. Now, I think there's another book percolating in my mind that will actually pick up from that. Uh, and, and that would be the next book, but but it's much broader than politics. I talk about family work and economics before I talk about politics. Nonetheless, in the chapter on politics, I talk precisely about that tension. And what I suggest is, in a metaphor that probably uh, sinks uh, more than it floats, but I suggest the tension could be thought of as like the surface tension of water, and a ship will only float on that on that uh, on that. A surface of water if all kinds of very complicated things obtain, considering the weight of the ship, the porousness of the material, the ballast, all sorts of things. And if any of those things fail, then the ship founders or sinks. Uh, we in American, we American Catholics need to not, be, not think about resolving the tension, but rather understanding that the tension itself has to be maintained. And what I suggest is that if we try to resolve the tension, it always gets resolved in favor of the political liberalism that informs broader public life. It doesn't get resolved in terms of the Catholic faith that should inform our moral lives. Mm -hmm. And, and again, so, and, 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 and therefore, and therefore where, as I say in the first chapter, we all wind up being liberal Protestants. <laughs> right, 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 right. Again, the, mm -hmm. the book has been received, you know, to such wide acclaim. It's been celebrated by Patrick Deneen, by Stanley Harawas, by Chad Pagnold, you know, and, and none, of, none of these people have uh the the same political views certainly um or or even the no, same I, approach to political I think theory. I'm pretty I'm pretty confident Father Patrick that it's the first book endorsed by both Scott Hahn and Stanley Hauerwas I, I I think the <laughs> I don't think that has ever happened before and I don't think it will ever happen again mm -hmm. uh, one one of the one of the reviews I enjoyed the most is by Larry Chap um uh, who, who's I, I think just a just a fabulous Catholic scholar uh, theologian. He is, and Chap you know dives into this problem that that we're all liberal Protestants, which is so striking. You know, just declaring that at the beginning of the book. Um, I agree with you. I think it's true. And Chap Chap digs into your thesis here. You know, pulling apart, saying, you know, you're you're basically making t you know a twin, and this is just mm. kind of rearticulation rearticulating yeah. some of what we've been saying. But there there are two two pillars here to this claim the two main principles that that define us as radical liberal protestants uh, uh, all of us and it's that that we have an, a fierce adherence to our personal autonomy and that we have an absolute commitment to individualism mm -hmm. um characterized you know to use your language by uh by our our desire to per, pursue individual rights as the, the basic moral foundation um, I think the, these two these two twins are, are really striking because um, I was always taught that those two things are are good things. Um, our <laughs> our autonomy, you know, that that's part of what makes us American, and our appreciation for for individual rights. Uh, so so I I kind of want to lean on those two things, and uh, I I I'd like to hear you hear you say a little bit more about um, about how we need to uh how we need to sort ourselves with with mm -hmm. respect to these twin twin pillars as catholics because mm -hmm. these are not things that mm -hmm. i want to give up i want to continue right. to keep my personal autonomy yeah. as an american citizen yeah. and i want to continue to perfect pr protect my individual rights right because you because because you view autonomy as the uh as it, more in terms of free agency and you view individual rights in terms of 
uh, uh, protections against encroachment upon your liberty or encroachments upon justice. And in and, and, and reformulating why you want to keep those things, I've partially answered the question that we have a better language for doing those two things. So rather than autonomy, I prefer the term moral agency. And I also prefer that mm -hmm. in terms of what, what we use rights to think that we're protecting. If we, if we emphasize th the dignity of the human person as one of the four pillars of Catholic social doctrine, that dignity necessarily entails, and I do, and I do a, a fairly careful reading of Genesis one, two, Genesis one through three to kind of buttress this from from the foundation of Scripture. If we believe uh, in the human dignity of the person created in the in the image and likeness of God, that includes moral agency, and that moral agency must be protected as an aspect of human dignity. If that's the case, then we don't need rights language to protect that. We need agency language. We need to understand that what what we what we what rights uh, 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 ostensibly protects from the standpoint of a Catholic is what a robust understanding of moral agency rooted in dignity protects. And this also takes care of the problem of autonomy, as 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 both of you know uh, extremely well. Autonomy means self law or self rule. Now, of course, in the American uh, American English, we usually mean it to mean that we're free to make our own decisions and things like that. And certainly that's true right. in the same way that Adam and Eve were uh, free to make their own decisions in the third chapter of Genesis. Uh, but but we don't rule ourselves. We are not we are not the creators of the law. You know, we are it, the, the law is uh, received uh, by us and our lives are ordered toward and by that law. And therefore, once again, agency is the word that we can use to uh, protect that rooted in dignity. And, and here's, here's one of the reasons that I have so much trouble with individual or autonomous rights language. And, 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 and my students uh, always initially bristle when I, when I have a full on frontal attack of rights language for precisely the reasons that you articulate. We want rights because we see them as protecting ourselves or protecting our interests or protecting some sense of justice. But, but what we have to understand is that in the history of moral, moral philosophy, the notion of individual rights didn't even arise until the 17th century. I mean, certainly, you know, your great, your great uh, uh, mentor, uh, Thomas Aquinas, had no theory of individual rights. He had a theory of natural, <laughs> natural right, of course, natural right rooted in justice. Uh, but, but, but he certainly wouldn't have recognized a Hobbesian mm. understanding of, of individual autonomous rights. And, and there's a there's a striking difference between those two things. And I think and, and in fact, individual rights, as invented by Hobbes, actually, it could be argued uh, is the purpose is to replace a teleological understanding of the human person as ordered toward the good with uh, an understanding of the human person that's not ordered toward anything except his own good. And Father Bonaventure, you mentioned or no, it was Father Patrick, you mentioned the city of God at the beginning. And what what. Uh, uh, Augustine explains in that, of course, is that we are ordered by one of two loves, love of self or love of God. And that earthly city is, uh, the, uh, is, is ordered by love of self and the heavenly city is ordered by uh, love of God. And if, if we love ourselves, what better language is there to use to describe that love of self than individual autonomous rights? And, and moreover, in the Hobbesian way of understanding rights, they're not simply insulations against government encroachment, but rather they are claims against everyone else, right? So, hmm. so individual rights are, 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 are disparate claims that I have against you and that you have against me without Hobbes said any kind of adjudicating principle, right? There's nothing, there's nothing that adjudicates my rights claim to everything against your rights claim to everything. And so as Hobbes said, we have a war of all against all. And of course, for Hobbes, the solution to that was a strong authoritarian government, the Leviathan. For Locke, the solution was enlightened contract, which you mentioned, Father Bonaventure. What we see, though, what we see, however, in both of those formulations is that the contract breaks down the more that we become inculcated by an understanding that we have these claims of rights. And even in a con even contracts are fictions. You know, the contracts are fictions that we invent among one another so that we'll, we'll, we'll try to enforce one another's obligations, whether it's an, a literal contract, you know, to, to purchase a, a good or a service or this uh, more amorphous social contract. Uh, since there's nothing to adjudicate between it. And so we see factionalism, 
we see uh, we see authoritarian government coming in to adjudicate rights because the enlightened contracts aren't working. So so yeah, we want to keep the we want to keep the liberties that we think rights protect. We want to keep the uh, the ability to make uh, choices and including contrary choices that we think autonomy protects. But we don't need rights language or autonomy language to protect either of those things. We need dignity. We need solidarity and we need a robust understanding of moral agency as part of what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. Yeah. Yeah. I think I agree with all that. Um, I guess I'm <laughs> coming from the Kantian t tradition. Um, I guess I'm, I'm hesitant with the, uh, with the stark dis disjunct between uh, Hob that Hobbesian rights and other things. I might think, well, you know, I don't have to believe in Hobbesian rights to believe in rights. Um, no, we'll you pass, don't. We'll and, right. I mean, we can, well, no, I mean, we, Rights well, are just well, correspondence me... of duties, and well, God gives okay. duties and commands, so we're good. Okay, so I'm glad you said that, because, because there are two ways that I can distinguish what I call the individual rights regime of the American context. Uh, mm -hmm. There are two ways that I can dis distinguish certain kinds of understanding of rights. One of those is, the, is what you just said. Uh, in uh, Simone Veal's famous essay, um, uh, The Need for Roots, she, that that's her classic description of an understanding of rights as derivative of duties. And there's obviously that she uses the word duties or obligations. So the, obviously there's a certain Kantian whiff to that, uh, even though she's certainly not a Kantian, but, but, kind but of it kind of Ten borrows that idea. Thing, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus. Even though, I mean, she was an yeah. odd, she was kind of a Jordan Peterson type of uh, Christian adjacent. I, I think she would be yeah. called Christian adjacent, but she has much yeah. to, to teach Christians and, and she roots uh, uh, rights to the extent that she roots them at all in prior obligations. Well, that's very different mm -hmm. because all rights are rights. Rights in that sense are sort of, if you think about the relationship in the U S between a law and a regulation, you know, the legislature makes a law, the regulatory agency makes regulations to implement it. That's sort of an analogous analogous to rights as the regulatory structure of obligations. I wouldn't have much trouble with that if, if that's the way that the typical American understands rights, but that yep. isn't sure. the typical way that the American yeah, yeah. understands rights. And yep. the, second, the, second, the second thing is that uh, I don't have any problem at all with what we might call legal rights or regulatory rights. You know, if you do certain things, you meet certain requirements, you have a right to drive a car, you have a right to buy a house or your right to job, all those things. Th th those are those are you know not I interesting for purposes of this argument. And they're really outside this, the scope of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think the um, what I'm interested I will switch to this uh, question um, since we go back and forth for fun. Um, is that we generally ask the question of can a uh, can an Amer can a Catholic be an American? It's generally how we kind of and, and you, make, you make nice strong claims. Actually, like yeah, of course, because of this this this. As long as we get rid of these sort of things. But I want to flip it and say actually, and see because of the Thomistic axiom uh -huh. um, that yeah. grace perfects nature and does not destroy it. Can we say? I want to say. Um, how is it that actually, I mean, the real question should be, can an American be anything but a Catholic? Like, how do, would you think the Catholic principles, in a sense, perfect, if we assume that, again, we're not going to the kind of American project is, is this darn, you know, too bad about this thing, we'll make the best we can with it. Um, uh, but rather, actually, it has something good about it. We should assume that mm -hmm. the goodness can be perfected by Catholic principles mm -hmm. in some fashion. So how, mm -hmm. so uh, tease this out, whether, um, whether not the question of can a Catholic be an American, but can, can a real American be anything but a Catholic in that kind of, you know, if I was going to mm -hmm. do a, a bold statement. Well, so the, the question then becomes, I, I, I think, I think that the question let me let me recast the question, and, and, okay. and, and you can tell me if I if I've recast it the right way. Is it in, in terms of uh, grace perfecting or perfecting uh, perfecting something? One of the things that I think that we make a mistake uh, in doing in re approaching a, a, a an answer to that question is to think that it's the purpose of Christian faith and Christian Christian moral thought to make America better or to make fill in the blank better. Now, mm -hmm. now I want to be very, very careful about the distinctions that I'm making here, because I'm not suggesting that, that, that we should have no concern about that. Certainly we should have concern about any culture in which we live being a salutary of having a salutary effect on that culture. What mm -hmm. I would suggest, however, again, to go to, to go to some familiar domestic, uh, Thomistic terms, we can't let making the culture better or 
aiding the culture to be better or to perfect itself the final cause of our moral action nor can we make it the final cause sure. of our efforts for discipleship. And the reason that I think that is that if that becomes the case, then we tend to flip your question back around to, to making uh, what, what essentially it, it means to be able to articulate what it means to be Catholic. It, it, it winds up uh, sounding white, like what it articulate, articulating what it means to be a good American. So what I think that we need to do right. is understand, understand that we, we have a responsibility are to evangelize, to witness to the good news, to live according to the precepts of the good news as the church has uh, shepherded those precepts through history. And that itself is, is the final cause of our moral action. And that will, by necessity, have a salutary grace-filled effect on society and therefore mm -hmm. make society a better place and move more toward perfection. Now, can again, and and I and I say this is suspending all of the issues of of the problems of perhaps uh, con uh, intention uh, uh, principles that are intention with or even contradictory to. But so sure. so I think that's I think that is I think that's a, a better approach. Uh, now, uh, as I say in the outset of the book, is that is that a quixotic? Is is, is this a quixotic book? And it, and it's my quest a quixotic one. Um, Perhaps <laughs> I, I admit that perhaps it is, but but here's the thing: if if we if if I can in, in my little corner of the world, hopefully will be a bigger uh, uh, corner once the the book uh, you know starts to get a broader mm -hmm. audience. If we can at least get Catholics to start start thinking that way, I think that would be a good thing, and I think the result, the net result, will be good for us as individual Catholics. It will be good for the church. And ultimately, to get back to your question, it will be good for perfecting society. So um, so I, I, I know I reframed the question uh, and, and, and I hope I, I answered the question as I reframed it. But but if not, certainly you'll tell me. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just interested in, in the sense that um, you had the title as Citizens and Strangers. And I assume that part of it's uh, that even though we are strangers, we're actually still really good citizens. We can be good citizens. Yes. So oh, it's yes. not like yes. it's not like you have. Uh, we there might be moments of tension, as with any sort of political, as you say, uh, yeah. regime where it's it's calling Christ or or it's Caesar, right? But that at the at at the core of it, actually, Catholics can be good citizens. Not and it's not yes. accident. We're not accidentally good citizens, but rather the cat being yes, Catholic helps us to be good citizens. I think that's what I was, so that the Catholic oh, allows yeah. you to be a better citizen than, than say a non, you know, you might even think that there's certain things that Catholics add to allow you to be a good citizen because of these principles um, that might not be available to say an, uh, an atheist or something. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's sort of very way. good. Yeah. That's very good. I, I, I agree with that. And, and I, I agree with that's that wholeheartedly. I and I really like the way that you, you articulated it. The title actually comes from the Epistle to Diognetus, which is a late uh, first or early second century apologetic work, and specifically chapter five of that of that letter. Mm -hmm. It covers a lot of things. But chapter five is the is a chapter on political life and the relationship of Christians to the Roman Empire. And uh, it actually wasn't my title. The publishers came up with the title or the editor editorial team. That's uh, good one. Ours. Uh, at RSV. Yeah, I agree. It's better than mine. My, my title is going to be neither left nor right. Uh, why yeah. Catholic, so why Catholic moral theology transcends American politics. I, I like their title. Neither better. market will buy it. It, it took me, <laughs> no, that's right. It, and neither market will buy it. it. It took me a while to warm up to. In fact, I have to tell you, I, I resisted the subtitle. Uh, but, uh, but they, it was prevailed upon me that that's, that's what we should use. And, but, but mm -hmm. that's what it comes from. And that's exactly what this anonymous uh, author says. It, and in fact, you put it, it, it's almost like you're paraphrasing the, the letter of, uh, Father Bonaventure, because he says yeah. that we are we are citizens in every land, but strangers in every land. We obey the law, it says, but in a way that transcends the law. And I actually seize upon that as a very important mm -hmm. point, because Caesar wants us to obey the law, but he wants us to obey the law in his terms and with his justification and rationale. And oftentimes, as you just said, we don't obey the law because of the rationale of obedience of the regime. We obey the law because of a different rationale informed by the gospel, informed by God as sovereign, who has delegated his sovereign authority to governments as, and I mm -hmm. obviously I have a, uh, in my chapter on politics, I have a discussion of 
both the Caesar's coin pericope from the Gospels and Romans 13. And I talk about how those two, those two go together to articulate a, a Christian understanding uh, that, we, uh, that government is a minister of God as long as government is consistent with what it means to be God's emissary on earth or God's uh, authority mm -hmm. on earth. And, and, and that's the way we justify our obedience. And there's, so there's for the, for Caesar, that's a, that there's a, that's a, there's some pros and cons to that Caesar likes it, that we are obedient, but he doesn't like it that our obedience is conditioned by something other than the rationale by which Caesar commands right. obedience. Because right. that means that we are always at least a threat to be subversive. Well, in the U.S., the Catholic Church is no longer subversive, right? It, 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 it for by mm -hmm. and large, well, let me put it this way. We Catholics are not subversive. The church is. The church will always be. Mm -hmm. But we Catholics, we Catholics need to be the salt of the earth, but we need to be uh, subsur subversive <laughs> salt, as it were, uh, mm -hmm. at least in terms of the priority of our moral commitments. And, and that's one, mm -hmm. of the, the, one of the arguments of the book. Mm -hmm. Well, we jumped in, you know, talking about the about rights language and some of these questions of Catholic political philosophy, because those are, you know, interesting to Father Bonaventure and I, and they're they're the kind of premise of the book. Um, listeners, when you go, when you go when you get the book, you'll find out that Ken, that Ken talks about many other topics. He talks about family mm -hmm. life, the dignity of work, the possibility of civic friendship. So I'd really encourage you to go and check it out to get a copy of Citizens Yet Strangers. Ken, if people are interested in following your work, um, wh where else can they find you? Well, I write uh, four columns a month for our Sunday Visitor and our Sunday Visitor News, three for our Sunday Visitor, uh, OSV News, rather, and our Sunday Visitor uh, newspaper. Those are always, those always appear online and all the, in, in the print edition of our Sunday Visitor. I also write a monthly column for our friends across the pond uh, in the UK for the Catholic Herald. And I write a monthly column for my archdiocesan magazine, the Cincinnati, uh, the uh, the Catholic Telegraph. So, but the the the, the best place to find my writing is in our Sunday Visitor, uh, because I have uh, uh, about four times a month a, a column appears there, and uh, and and uh, that's where I develop some of these thoughts, and and also the broader uh, uh, the broader cultural issues that I address there, and including you know civic friendship, which I actually wanted to return to bon Father Bonaventure's point there, because I think I like the term civic friendship better than uh, citizenship, because I think that's what we're called to be. We're called to be good citizens, good, good civic friends. And the last chapter of the book, I, you know, taking up a theme from Alistair McIntyre, I talk about that. So, so that's, that's where you can find me. And of course you can get the book at osvbooks.com, osvbooks.com. I believe the shipping is free or, or wherever else that you buy books, but uh, osvbooks.com will get it to you quickly and with free shipping. Friends, pick up the book. It's a great little edition. It's a very beautiful book. Uh, it's highly acclaimed, and I think it, it talks about many of these topics, which are so interesting to listeners on the show. Ken, thanks so much for joining us. You know, we're so happy to have you on. Thank uh, you. It's been a delight. Thanks, of course, to all of our listeners for your support, for your prayers. Um, again, if you'd like to consider donating to our project, uh, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Like and subscribe to God's Planning on YouTube, on Instagram. Follow us there on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, on TikTok. Uh, sign up to receive regular communications from God's Planning at godsplanning.org. We have information there on upcoming events, including retreats and other, other one-day opportunities to meet the friars and hang out with us. Please know above all of our prayers for you, our listeners, and we ask that you would pray for us. Thanks so much for joining us today. God bless.